Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, Leading an Effective Test Organization with a High Performance Test Team by Tom Staub. We're excited we were able to join us today and set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one in a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming SQTM conference in San Diego, California, September 13th through the 18th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. The conference focuses on advancing the test management and quality management professions by providing practical methods based on best practices. The ongoing theme of the conference, Practical, Proven, Feasible, keeps the focus on what works. To view the conference program and more information, visit www.qualitymanagementconference.com. Be sure to join us for the next webinar in the series, Testing Mobile Devices, Unique Functionality by Michael Uden on March 24th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and other webinars in the series, go to www.qualitymanagementconference.com. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available within 48 hours at www.qualitymanagementconference.com. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Tom Staub. Tom? Hello everyone, this is Tom, and I just want to tell you that what I'm going to be presenting today is just a taste, just one hour of an eight hour tutorial, and my tutorial is going to be, on this topic is going to be presented on Monday, September 13th at the conference. I hope to, you'll join me there, and I look forward to talking to you. Now, I just want to remind you that the content of this presentation is protected by intellectual property laws, and it does contain intellectual property and copyrighted information. Let's get started. The, the title contains three words that are significant for what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these three topics, team, high performance, and lead. When I want to find the definition of something, I usually go to my old trusty Web Webster's New World Dictionary. And in there, team is described as a group of people working together in a coordinated effort. So we, that's what we do when we work together with our people uh, on our jobs. So we've got three types of teams we're going to we cover in the tutorial. The first is our permanent teams. And these are teams that we've put together on a permanent basis and they are they work together every day. They've got a unified purpose and they go from there. The next one is a temporary team. And a lot of people call these teams uh, task forces and audit teams or whatever problem-solving teams, but they're temporary teams that are brought together for one purpose and one purpose only. And as soon as that purpose is completed, then the team is disbanded. The third team is a virtual team. Now, this Virtual team can, income, can be part of either a permanent team or a temporary team. All it means is not all of the team members are in one location. And it's not unusual to have virtual teams where people are could be scattered uh, halfway around the world from each other. And they meet with video conferencing or teleconferencing. And these are probably the hardest teams to manage of any of them because they're not all in one location. So let's look at the types of teams. We've got sports teams. We all know about them. We're in the midst of March Madness right now. So we've got sports teams out there playing, and they're on TV, you know, just constantly. The next type of team are work teams, and these are the ones we're going to be talking about in this uh, webinar and in the tutorial. And these are the teams that we put together at work to do a job. 
There's formal and informal teams. A formal team is the one that we charter, that we put together, and that we have on an ongoing basis. The informal teams are the ones that group together on their own. And it's a loose, informal group of people that come together to solve a problem. And you could be a part of a uh, the Rotary or any club of that nature, and you're going to have some informal teams that somebody says, hey, we got a problem, and a group of others say, yeah, I agree with you, and they get together to solve the problem. Then you've got committees. We all know about committees because, trust me, we've all been part of it. We've all seen them at work. So there are committees, and these committees are really teams. They're problem-solving teams. Remember I told you that it's temporary teams. Um, the temporary teams can either be a committee they can be a problem-solving team. Then you've got the self-directed or self-managed teams. These are very hard uh, to manage. When you have a self-managed or a self-directed team, a lot of times they lose focus. They, they go off on a tangent and they don't get the things done that really need to get done, so you need to watch out when you see this, when you set up a self-directed or self-managed team, because they can create problems for you. And then you, as I said, you've got virtual teams, and these teams are hard to manage, but they are successful. I've seen them be very successful in solving problems and getting jobs done, and even being part of a test team that uh, we have team members that are in different parts of the of the country or around the world. I worked on one where uh, we had test team. They were testing a system, and we had members in Orlando, Seattle, and Sydney, Australia. So it can work, but you just got to know that there are, can be problems with them. There are team compositions. So you need a mix of people. People who consistently prove themselves. These are people that are high achievers. They, they see, they come together, they've got a problem, and they solve a problem. You need these type people on this team. And then you've got people who have not had an opportunity to present themselves. And I've had people on teams, brought people on teams that I saw potential in, but they hadn't been recognized for that potential, and they hadn't had the opportunity to present them to uh, prove themselves, and they did very well on their, their team. And then you need the grinders. These are the people that just get out there and work, do the job, and get the job done. They, they just grind away at it. You also need creators. And you can't have a team of all grinders or all creators because the creators are the ones that give you the spark, give you that idea that nobody else thinks about. They say, hey, what happens if? And they're the ones that, that really come up with some neat ideas. So you need that creative touch, that creative group within your team. And you need to figure out the best person for your team. So you've got to have in mind what this team needs. You've got to look at the, at the type of people that are available and go out there and get them. 
Now, there are two different things. You've got team building and team development. Well, team building is what I told when I said you've got to look at what you what type of people you need and go out there and get them. That's team building. That's where you're building this team with the type of individuals you need. Team development is after you get these people together and you start working and you start developing them into a cohesive team. Now, there are 12 C's to team building. You have to have clear expectations. You got to know where you're going with this team and what do you expect out of that team. The next one is context. And another way to put that is why. Why are we putting this team together? What do we what why are we wanting to build this team? Then you have to have commitment. And every member of this team has to be committed to the expectations and the goals of this team. Then you have the next C is competence. Well, you are picking the team members either by bringing them in from other areas of your organization and reassigning them, or you're going out and recruiting them. So you've got to know that they have the competence to do the job that you expect. Next C, the fifth C is charter. Every team has to have a charter. And that, usually the team originator will develop a charter. But that doesn't mean that that's locked in stone. Because that charter can be changed by higher level management or, surprisingly, by the team members themselves. Once you bring them together and present the charter, I have I've found a lot of times that they'll make suggestions to that charter that are very good and enhance what that team is supposed to do. Then you've got control. And control means that you just you got to have control of the group, have control of the team members. You don't want to be iron-handed about it, but you still have to control where that team goes. And sometimes a better way to turn to phrase that instead of control is to guide. That you need to guide those people or the people on the team. The next C is collaboration. And first thing that's going to probably pop in your mind is collaboration amongst the team. That's great. You're going to have to have that. These, these team members are going to have to be a tight group to make it work. And, but remember, Collaboration also means you have to collaborate with people outside your own normal team. And so you've got, you're probably working with other people on a project. If you're testing a system, you're going to be working with developers. You're going to be working with requirements analysts, architects. So you've got to collaborate with them. So that takes communications, which is your next C. You need to communicate not only internally with, within the team, but externally with all of your the people that have a vested interest in what you're doing. And creative innovation is the ninth C. You want creative innovation. 
you don't want people going off on their own, but you want that creative creativity as part of this whole thing. And then you've got consequences. People have to know what the consequences are of failure as the team. So make out be very specific of your expectations and the consequences of not performing to those expectations. The eleventh one is coordination. And you, you're going to have to coordinate both internally and externally. So that's a big part of team building. Team building is the coordination. Once you put this team together, you're going to change culture, the culture of the people and the culture of the, the workforce as a whole is going to change because of the formation of this team. So you just be aware that you're going to have a culture change involved in building this team. The next one is team development. You got to describe the skills that you need and the skills that are going to be part an integral part of this team. Find the best person to fill that need. So either go out and recruit internally or you're going to recruit externally. But you've got to have find the best person to fill that need. Then you want to bring the team together. And you don't just bring them together physically, because sometimes with a virtual team, you can't bring them together physically, but you've got to bring them together emotionally and bring them to where they feel a part of this team and that they have a unified purpose of where they want to go. And you decide on each team member's role. Each member of this team has to have a defined role for you all to be successful. There are five stages of team development. A lot of literature you're going to find will only list four. But I feel that there are really five. And we're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit. So the first one is forming. And I told you that when you're building your team, you're going out and bringing together people that you feel are the good fit for where you want to go and what you want to do with this team. So that's forming. And once you select your members, they are part of this forming uh, operation. Well, once you've brought them together and they start working together, conflicts are going to arise. So you're going to have storming. And this is inevitable. Every team is going to go through five parts, all five stages of team development. Don't worry about when you get into the storming stage. You just need to understand that it's going to happen, that you need to sell, go through it, but you need to go through it as quickly as possible. If you let it linger, it's going to be destructive. So you've got to plan for this storming stage and get through it. Once you've got through it, then you get into the norming stage. And that's where you really settle down and you start coming together as a team and start working together. Well, that leads to performing. Only after you've gone through the form, 
the storm, the norm, can you actually get to perform? And that's where you really do your work is when you've got to this phase. Okay, let's talk about the last part of this, and that's mourn. And why do I say mourn in here? Well, I've never seen a team that stays together forever. You're always going to lose team members. They're either going to apply for another job or something is going to happen and you're going to lose members of the team. It's a normal evolutionary process. And there's going to be a mourning phase for the loss of those team members. And once you replace those team members that have left, then you're going to go back and you get a replacement, you're going to go back through these four previous phases because any change to the group dynamics that you have developed is going to change when you bring in somebody new. So this brings us to what if you are a team leader? and you're inheriting a team that has been in existence for a while. A very successful team, maybe. Or it may be a team that is not performing up to expectations, and you're brought in to be a part to lead this team. Well, guess what? You are a change in the dynamics. So once you enter the picture, then the team is going to go through the form, storm, norm, perform phase again to get used to you. I've, it's not unusual today in an interview process to, for the selecting manager to get the candidate that they think they want, and then they bring them either on through a Skype interview or phone interview or uh, bring them in face-to-face -face interview, but bring them in to meet the other members of the team to see how they fit within that team. That's great, but you got to remember even after you do that and you bring them on board and they start working, the team is still going to go through the form, storm, norm, form stages to, where, to the point that they can perform together. So the second term that we had is high performance. And a high-performance team does not just complete projects. They, they do a lot. The project is the vehicle for them. And so they, a high-performance team, they work together, they solve problems, and they complete everything efficiently. And rather than work hard, they work smart. Because once you get this team together, they get to the perform stage. And remember, I said you need the creative people in there. Well, you can't stem that creative flow. So they start working smart, and they start figuring out, hey, what happens if we do this, and we can do it more efficiently, and we can do it better? and they improve the efficiency and overall value of the company because they are a close-knit, high-performance team that is working smart and efficiently. So what's the formal definition of a high-performance team? High-performance team don't, don't just complete projects. They complete them efficiently. 
rather than work hard, they work smart, and they, which means they improve the efficiency and overall value of the company for which they work. This is the formal definition. I, the previous slide, I broke it all down into bullets so that I feel it's easier to understand. So, high performance teams has defined what success looks like. They know what success looks like and they work to make that success. Actions are guided by specific values. That team has defined their success values and they have developed their own value system within the team. So they're guided by specific values and it's made up of the right people. And remember the movie The Right Stuff? Well they did that with the astronauts, the original seven astronauts. They got the right people in there what did success look like? Success looked like we were going to put somebody in space and do it successfully. And they were guided by specific values. And you have the right people in the right place to do this. They've identified barriers to success. They, they as I said, they know where they want to go. They've developed their, what success looks like. So in the process, they have identified the barriers that are in front of them to impede their success. And by doing that, they've planned to eliminate or minimize those barriers. So once they've identified them, they figure out how do we eliminate those barriers or if we can't eliminate them, how do we minimize them? And they conduct periodic uh, pro progress evaluations to see where they are with regard to where they want to go. Now, there are specific characteristics of a high performance team. They have a participative, I can't talk today, participative leadership and what that doesn't mean the team runs everything. You have a team leader but the members of that team participate in the leadership. They're free to, su to suggest things. They're free to to uh, identify barriers, they, br they are free and willing to bring up things to the leader for the good of the team. They align on purpose. They know where they want to go. They know what the purpose of the team is, so they align on that purpose. They're task focused. They focus on the task at hand. What do we need to do to be successful? And they know what they have to do and they're focused on how to get it done. They shared responsibility. The ultimate responsibility of the team falls on the team leader. But the team leader cannot be success, successful unless the members of that high performance team share, feel a shared responsibility that they are a part of this team and they were, are responsible for a success or failure. They're innovative. Oh. I've found some teams that are very innovative. Uh, 
they they can come up with solutions to problems a lot of times before the team leader doesn't even realize that there is a problem. So you you want to encourage this innovation by your team members. Problem solving, oh, they solve the problems. And even if they bring up a problem to the team leader, usually they've got a proposed solution that they also present. And you want to encourage that. You want, if they bring you a problem, you want them to propose a solution. They're communicative not only between themselves, but with the team leader and with people outside the team. They have to have good communication skills, both oral, written. So you need all kinds of communication skills of your team members. And they're responsive. The worst thing that can happen to your team is if they get a, let's say, a message, an email from somebody outside the team asking a question or bringing up a problem or so, whatever, and the team members ignore them. They are not responsive to them and not responsive immediately. Yes, there's going to be times when they have to put it off, put off the response for an hour or so, but you don't want them to put it off to the point that they that they alienate the people outside that are trying to communicate with them. It doesn't reflect well on your organization, on your team, if this is constantly happening, because you're going to hear complaints from people outside the group. So what are the keys to success? Top management commitment. Management has to be committed to, let, to forming this team and letting it run and giving it support. You have to have good leadership in this team, and you, the team has to be accountable for their work. So let's look at developing the team. We, I'm repeating this slide, but I think it needs to be repeated because you've got to decide what skills you need. You've got to find the best person to fill that need. You bring them together, and you decide on the team members' roles. So once you have developed this team, then you've got, you've got to consider what the team needs. They need common goals. And so, and you need leadership. That's you, is out, is are the leader. Member interaction and involvement. You cannot be successful without this member interaction and involvement. On a virtual team, this is hard. Because uh, when people are in the same location, they interact constantly on a daily basis, hourly basis, sometimes minute by minute basis. But when they're a virtual team, this interaction and involvement is hard, and that's your job as a leader to make sure that this has an opportunity to happen. And you want to peep the team members to maintain individual self-esteem. There's nothing worse than if your team members lose their self-esteem. You're sunk. So you've got to have that individual self-esteem at a 
very high a level. And as I've said before, you need open communications between the team members and the, the stakeholders in what you're doing. You have to have group power. Well, that sounds funny, but it's not because these people together are very powerful. You got to remember that. So you've got to maintain and build that group power. They need to have attention to the process. Einstein said if well not Einstein Deming said that if you can't identify what you're doing in a process, you don't know what you're doing. So you've got to develop your processes, and then the team members have to be attentive to that process. Now, I'm going to give you a clue. You can't just develop a process, and it's there for perpetuity. Be prepared. A process needs to change as the situations change that influence that process. So there are times when you're going to be changing your process fairly frequency, frequently. Other times, your process is going to work for a year, maybe two years. So just be aware of it. The team members have to have mutual trust. They have to trust each other. Because remember, they're working together as a cohesive unit. So they've got to trust each other. We're individuals. So individuals have differences. Each one of us is unique. But people have to respect others' differences. They cannot be bad-mouthing those differences. They've got to respect them. And there's, you have to have constructive conflict resolution because conflicts, as we all know, are going to come up. So you've got to have constructive conflict resolution. And you can't resolve it by breaking down somebody's individual self-esteem. You've got to figure out how you're going to, to resolve this conflict without breaking people's self-esteem down. H. Ross Perot has, got, had a, has a saying, and he used it when he was developing EDS, and I believe it. He says, eagles don't flock. You have to gather them one at a time. What he means is, we've been talking about what do we need as team members. Well, this fits because, as I said, you're going to decide what you need, and then you're going to go out and find them. This fits right there with what we just said. Leadership. Leadership is the process of social influence in which one person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. This came from Wikipedia, and it fits very well because it is a process of social influence. You are influencing people to do things. You're not ordering them to do things. So when you're a leader, you're influencing. Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. She is was one of the pioneers in the information technology field. She helped develop the COBOL language. And she she retired three times. The third time was the charm, and they finally really retired her. The first two times, they kept bringing her back. And she was a very smart lady. 
And she says, we went overboard on management and forgot about leadership. That we, the problem today is that we continue managing people, and sometimes we call it leadership, and it's not. She says that you don't manage people, you manage things, you lead people. So if you'll keep that in mind, when you're going through this whole thing, it'll help you. And there are two different styles out there. You've got management style, and you've got leadership style. Every individual has a propensity to one of these. And you have to work at the other one. So you're either a natural leader, and you have to work at the management skills, or you're a natural manager, and you have to work at the leadership skills. Only when these two things overlap and merge are you going to be successful. So let's look at some things, some characteristics. When I went through college and I was taught management, I was taught that managing is, that a manager has to know what they call PODC, planning, organizing, directing, controlling. Then that was what we all, what we all learned, that you had to plan, organize, direct, and control the work. Well, guess what? We've added some things. We now know that a manager has to staff their organization. They're coordinating all the time. They're preparing and managing budgets. They're developing strategy. They're making decisions. They're solving problems. They're, they've got logistics and supply management. Okay, how do, what, what do we need? How do we get it in here? Then they've got time management. So they want to not only manage their own time, but how do we manage the time for the team? And resource use. What resources do we need, and how are we going to use those resources once we get them? Managers have subordinates. They wield authority and power. Sometimes they wield that authority and power too much. They're too heavy-handed with it. And when they do that, they alienate their subordinates. They are work-focused. They, work, they focus on getting the job done. They seek comfort. They seek uniformity. Well, if you've got if you've got a manager that's a strong manager, uh, they don't like the people that don't color within the box. They don't like the people that are not uniform with what they they're thinking. They see problems. But then they formulate policy to solve those problems. They take charge. Oh gosh, they they take charge. They they order people in the battle. They perform duties. They like formality. They're the ones that are going to be wearing the tie, the coat and tie. They're the ones that are going to be one to call, want to be called Mr. or Mrs. or by their title. They want formality. They plan around things. They don't face the problem. They plan around how to get around the problem. They're skeptical. You bring them a problem or you bring them a suggestion. They're skeptical. Their first, their first response is probably no. 
So just be prepared. They perpetuate hierarchies. They love hierarchies. And they do everything they can to perpetuate that. And they have a transactional style of, that gets them uh, through the work. And we're going to be talking more in detail about what a transactional style is in the tutorial. So we've looked at managers. Let's look at leaders. You've got two types of leaders. And you've probably seen and worked with both of them. The formal leader is the leader that is named the leader of a group. They're the ones that are hired to do that t job. The informal leader are the ones that assume a leadership role. On a sports team, Let's look at a sports team, because we all know it. I'm, I'm a football fan, so I'm going to use football. The formal leaders of a football team are the coaches, the general manager, and the quarterback, because the quarterback calls the plays. Uh, you, But usually the quarterback may be given the plays from the sideline from the from the quarterback's coach or the offensive coordinator. Now, there are informal leaders. And sometimes these informal leaders can also be formal leaders. But let's look at informal leaders. They're the ones that are not named as leaders. They're not, they don't wear a C on their uniform for captain. But they're the ones that motivate the team. They're the ones that get things done. So. A lot of times your informal leaders are the ones that are going to get things done, uh, sometimes better than the formal leaders. Now, leadership styles. You've got authoritarian leaders. These are the ones that basically, I'm the leader, you're going to follow me. The better type of leader is the facilitating leader. They're the ones that, yes, they know they're the formal leader. They know they have the authority, but they don't wield it. They facilitate things getting done. Then you've got the democratic leader. The democratic leader is the one that put things up for votes from the group. Let me tell you, this sounds like a neat idea, but it doesn't always work. We're going to go into each one of these leadership styles more in depth in the tutorial. And then you've got the laissez-faire leader. And they just, oh, well, whatever. And then basically the group runs themselves. They don't really care. Um, we just go along, and with whatever happens, trust me, a laissez-faire leader is not going to be around long. Now, what's a leader's focus? Well, a leader focuses on influencing people. They, they influence people to do things. They, they don't order them. They influence them. They have a vision of where this team is going to go and how to get there. They're an inspiration to their team members. The team wants to follow them. They want to do what that team leader has. They persuade people to do things. They don't order them. They motivate them. There are several ways to motivate people, and they use them. So they motivate people to, to get the job done. They form relationships. That doesn't mean they go out and have a drink after work with their team members all the time, but they do form relationships with their team members. They develop teamwork. They're not just telling people what to do. They're actually getting out there and helping do the work. They listen. They counsel. Uh, 
somebody's doing something wrong, they sit down with them and they counsel them and then they coach them of how to get things, how to do things better and do it right. They teach. They teach their team members how to do things. And then they mentor. They are a mentor for their team. So leaders have followers. They apply influence. They're people focused. They seek risk. They're not one to shy away from risk. They'll seek it and they'll figure out how to get around that risk. They pursue unity. They want the team to work together. They want the team to be a cohesive unit. They see opportunities and they set examples and they encourage delegation. We're going to talk more about what really delegation is because a lot of people think they delegate and they don't because delegating means that you you delegate people to do jobs but the responsibility for the success of the work lies with the leader you don't you can relinquish the delic by delegating you can relinquish people doing the job but you don't de delegate the responsibility for its accomplishments they pursue dreams they prefer prefer informality in a in a leadership style of team the team leader is going to be called by their first name probably Tom or Mary or Jane whatever they want the team members to be comfortable around them to be comfortable with each other they're optimistic they feel we can get this job done they're a glass half full type person so they're very optimistic they strive for equality they want everybody to be equal and they have a transformational style and we're going to we'll, again in the tutorial we're going to talk more about what is a transformational style so let's look at where you are at the lowest level people follow you because they have to well if you're a new leader of a team this is where you're going to come in. The people are going to follow you because they have to. And the next step up is they're going to follow you because they want to. They've, they've decided you're okay and you're a, you have the potential of being a good leader, so they want to follow you. The third step is people follow you because of what you have done for the organization. In other words, you've proved your worth. So people want to follow you. The fourth level is people follow you because of what you have done for them personally. And as you work with people, this is going to develop when you because you're going to do things for people as individuals and then you're really higher up on this scale of them wanting to follow you and the last level is they follow you because of what of who you are and what you represent in other words they've taken your medal they've looked at you and they've decided you're a person we want to follow so let's look, do a wrap up here and a high performance team is multifaceted. It's not one level. It's multifaceted. Team building versus team development. You build the team and then you develop the team. Leadership versus management. We're going to talk a lot more about leadership and management in the one hour in the one day tutorial. Leading a high performance test team takes courage and trust me 
you you can't be successful at this without being courageous and stepping off and going out there and putting yourself and making yourself vulnerable. So again, I want to remind you that the conference is September 13th through the 18th at the Sheridan San Diego Hotel and Marina. I hope to see you there on the 13th when I do my tutorial. And if I don't get a chance to answer your questions now, and you think of something, please send me an email, reference this webinar. I'll be happy to answer, to answer your questions. Eric, I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you, Tom, for your time today, and thanks to everyone for joining us for today's webinar sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. For more information on how IIST can help you and your organization, please visit www.iist.org. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you all for joining us today, and have a great day.